Good morning, Ian. It's good to be back with you. Hello, hello, Ali. Very good to see you again. Okay. So today we're going to cover Chapter Fourteen: Reasons, Claims, on Truth. Um, where should yeah. we begin? Well, let me just make some sort of preliminary remarks um, about reason. Um, the most important thing and, and the least fascinating thing, <laughs> uh, because it sounds very dull, is to say that reason is extraordinarily important, but going beyond it is also extraordinarily important. Uh, Pascal, uh, with his usual pitiness, uh, put it like this, that there are two excesses. One is to exclude reason and the other is to allow only reason in. And uh, th that's, a, that's a very simple point, but it's also a terribly important one, because I find that in many of the uh, debates on, 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 how, on epistemology, really, how we know, it tends to be, it, people tend to fall into opposing camps of those who, you know, see any, any suggestion that reason has any kind of limitations as an attack on reason. And then you have people who, and there's quite a substantial number of them, whose insight that there is more than reason in this world leads them to undervalue and even in some cases to dismiss reason. And neither of these positions is, is at all helpful. In fact, they're both rather dangerous. Mm. So I just wanted to start with making that, that point. Yes, I guess the whole of your book, in a way, at least to me, is this exercise of how to be very reasonable but also go beyond it as you said so what does it really mean to go beyond reason as you just suggested I think we can cover this now is to realize maybe with reason that it has that reason has its own limits but then also yes. to cure ourselves from this nature response of thinking that to go beyond reason means to somewhat become irrational right and, and yes yes mm. no it's not um, and again, Pascal, who after all was a great mathematician and logician, said that um, there are an infinite number of things that lie beyond the power of reason to comprehend, and reason is very feeble if it cannot see that. Uh, and, and indeed it can, in the sense that one can quite reasonably point to things that are not irrational, mm. um, but are full of meaning and importance. And one of the most obvious examples is music. Mm. The experience of listening to a profound piece of music can be life-changing. It can be so life-enhancing as to bring one back from a state of despair to one in which one, you know, values life again. And yet, it's not something that can be expressed in reason. Mm. Uh, and of course, there's a relationship, a close one, between the idea of reason and logic, because in a way, um, at least we think of reasoning when we reflect on it using our retrospective left hemisphere vision of what's been going on. We see it in language, we see it as a matter that is depends on language and to a large extent that is what people mean about reasoning is to r be able to write down some propositions and to deal with those. Um, but it's very obvious that there's much that lies beyond language that is still very important, much of the m most important experiences we have. So y yes, I think that's, that's a, a good point. I think it's also worth saying fairly early on uh, that uh, there are two kinds of ideas of reason uh, that really are on the surface rather opposed to one another and one is the idea of a linear algorithmic um, serial process looking for chains of causation and usually uh, focusing on some fairly local proposition or local uh, perception and it tends to be rather inflexible. In fact, its strength um, might be said to be the fact that it's inflexible, that if you follow these procedures, you can get to a certain place. I mean, in fact, I think we should talk about that a bit more later, because uh, that's a, a, a misconception. You can use reason 
uh, philosophers have been doing it for thousands of years, and if they all arrived at the same place, there would be no more philosophy. We'd have it all already, and we don't. <laughs> so it's quite clear that reasoning can lead you to different places. But there's that kind, anyway, which I would call the sort of linear and local. And I'd like to contrast that with something that is uh, holistic and global and only makes sense in the round. So rather than this idea of a chain that is a line, instead of thinking of um, the way in which I prefer to think of an understanding is coming from seeing things from a number of points of view, from circling around something, uh, taking the whole thing in until it begins to come into focus or crystallise for us. So uh, I think that it, it's enormously helpful in these discussions to, to, to point to the fact that reason, a lot of cross, cross, uh, uh, you know, uh, cross talk can happen in which people don't connect with one another because they're talking about two completely different things. Mm -hmm. and, it, and in most languages, well, I don't know about most languages, but in, in uh, a number of languages that I know, such as Greek and Latin and German, there are distinct words for these kinds of reason. Um, but in English, there aren't. Although I tend to use uh, reason and rationality. And, and I, 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 I'm using them in a rather special sense because I think most people would say, well, you can use them interchangeably. So the history of the languages that people do use them interchangeably. But because we don't have any other way of distinguishing them, I call reasonless ability to balance um, a form of logic with the wisdom that comes from experience, what one knows from intuition, everything about the context here. Um, I, I, I use reason for that and rationality for the uh, abstract, context independent uh, thrashing out of an algorithm, which is, for my mind, rather close to what um, a computer can be trained to do, whereas reason is something a computer cannot ever be trained to do, because you have to be a human being and lead a human life in order to be able to bring that experience to bear. So would it be fair to say that reason includes rationality, but it supplements it with emotion and imagination and intuition? And that's a kind of wisdom, a more elevated form of knowing? I, I would certainly say that, yes. I think that's a very good way of putting it. And, and again, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that reason encompasses rationality, but rationality doesn't encompass reason. So once again, uh, and what one finds this, um, it's like Brighton Rock, it's all the way down. <laughs> the, there is this distinction between the right hemisphere's capacity to see something that is large but takes into its scope the relatively constricted vision of the left hemisphere, mm. whereas the left hemisphere, precisely because it has a constricted vision, mm. doesn't see the need for something beyond it. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, going back to part one of the matter with things, to think of reason and, r and rationality. Um, yes, making this and, and there we, we looked at, when we were talking about schizophrenia and autism, I raised the point that uh, there is a, a loss of reasonableness there. I mean, the one thing you would never say after a conversation with somebody suffering from schizophrenia or autism is, they were very reasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. Reasonable is uh, seeing things in perspective, seeing them in context, perhaps even seeing them with a little bit of a sense of humour, being able to balance things, not being certain, absolutely non-mechanistic in its feel. And it seems to me that it's not only something that um, is not easily found in schizophrenia and autism, but it's also increasingly absent from contemporary life from our modern culture. Um, it, it, I think it, this started happening around the time of the, the, the Second World War or, or even slightly before that, but it has certainly progressed enormously so that nowadays it's very difficult to have an exchange in any kind of public forum with somebody who you'd say, well, they were very reasonable. Uh, even on simple things, you try to fix a problem or ring up a helpline or whatever. There's no reasonableness here. There are only procedures. And of course, that's the most trivial example. But uh, you know, going wider to areas in which a sense of the limits of what one can be certain about, the need to have a sense of proportion and a sense of humour, to be able to temper reason with other things, that seems to be disappearing. Mm. 
Yes, yes, and this is a very important point because it's urgent in a way that we hear a lot of debate mm. about debate, but we hear less about dialogue logos or conversation. And and that's something you cover also in this in this chapter, which is very interesting to me. You make this other distinction between um, the idea of awakening minds and the idea of compelling minds with reason, right? Yes, like bullying, yes. bullying, bullying each other's mind, each other's minds through reasons, like the idea that you do what I think because the argument so, some, somehow says so. So it's a very interesting yes. way of yes. forcing one another. And and a less explored way would be one where, well, we are conversing. And so we're, we're sharing different points of view rather than, than forcing each other through supposedly objective reasoning. Uh, absolutely. And that's a point that's been made across the philosophical field um, from Nietzsche, uh, uh, famously saying that reason doesn't uh, produce a single solution to a problem. Uh, attending any public meeting will convince you of that fact. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on the other hand, somebody like Weizmann, who was um, absolutely a, a philosopher of logic, uh, who made the same point that reason can never compel. Mm -hmm. All it can do is illuminate something that you hope attracts your mm -hmm. interlocutor to, to follow a certain thing. And what I think is important is that we can't put something into somebody ever. Uh, this is a, a point about education in general, that education doesn't just try to stick information into somebody but to evoke in them an understanding that is already latent there mm -hmm. and if it's not latent there it can't be awoken mm -hmm. uh, Madame de Sévigny 18th century blue stocking uh, uh, said that um, or she's a 17th century I think um, blue stocking said that you know if you do, there are certain things if you don't see them at once you can't see them in other words they don't come from following a chain of reasoning, they come as an insight. Uh, you suddenly see something that falls into place and makes better sense. And so that's really um, what I hope for my book, as I often say, is that I want to take people to a place where they can recover knowledge that they already have, to sort of unveil an understanding that is already in them. Mm -hmm. And it's very pleasing that one of the reactions I get from readers is that somehow they were led to, to, to be able to understand and to express things that they, they knew really in their heart of hearts all along. I find this fascinating, the idea that not only that there's something latent in us, therefore we don't need to be convinced, but that by using reason, not just rationality, but reason, you can you can show or unconceal something as desirable for the other person. So then it's, it's, yes. it's the force that comes from within the other person. It's now pulled towards that thing more than you pushing it towards. And that's very organic. That's, that's lovely. Mm. Yes, and another thing about that is that it suggests um, an alternative to our uh, uh, point of view which is always this polarity between what is subjective and what is objective and and though those words do have a meaning I, I, I again could could say more about that but reality is an encounter I, I mean it, everything that we experience everything that we know comes from an encounter between us and something else we conceive of it as outside mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. but it is part of our experiential world and there is a reciprocal connection um, and, and some people think that that means that um, there would be no purpose in the idea of trying to um, get beyond one's own prejudices uh, and, and that's not what I'm saying I'm saying there is such a thing as the objective but that it doesn't equate with the very peculiar disposition of mind whereby everything uh, <laughs> that is human and personal has been taken out of the encounter that isn't going to make it more real it's just going to make it a very special very particular highly stylized kind of an encounter no the way to to validate the idea that one is onto something is by repeated examination of it with other people. So it can be valid by an intersubjective uh, process where 
in, in philosophical dialogue and through experience in one's own life, one finds that a certain position is more generally reliable and generally accepted by what other people are able to see. And so that my idea of objectivity is espousing as many of the fruitful points of view about something as one can before arriving at a conclusion. But it's not by cutting out everything that is uh, human. I mean, that would be a very odd thing to do. Yes. Yes, maybe that's related to to the partially partially given and, and partially hidden, which you also allude in your chapter, right? Like that this encounter always discloses things, but never completely. And so why stop and say, well, that's as far as I can get or avoid also the other tendency, which is, well, who knows? We cannot know anything. Well, things are real enough, but it's through this continuous encountering that we can figure out what's going on. And uh, what that put me in mind of is um, a very nice tale of the uh, 17th century Japanese poet Basho, the greatest of the writers of haiku. And it said that one of his students was talking to him about poetry and Basho said the problem with most poetry is that it's either subjective or objective. Mm. And the student looked, looked a bit puzzled and said, do you mean too subjective or too ob objective? And Basho's answer in total was no. <laughs> in other words, he, he, he was saying that the whole idea of the objective and subjective as commonly understood is missing some important point mm. about uh, the intersubjective intercourse of, of, of minds and of our mind with reality. Mm. A way to enact... And it's with Sorry, go on. I was going to say the, a way okay. to, to enact that pursuit is, as you mentioned, through what's called second person philosophy, which, which surprised me to find, right? Rather than writing in the third person, as many scientists do, or philosophers, as if we're talking about something that doesn't have to do with us, or doing it in a first person, as, as if this was only about the, the person who's writing. W when you do it in second person, you're addressing explicitly another one. And so it's it's all the time intersubjective. Yes, I, I, I think that is an important point and it's not original uh, to me. And I, I, there are two contemporary philosophers who, who make this point uh, separately. One that I know is Rupert Reed, um, who, who's written uh, quite extensively about the idea of philosophy in the second person. And, and the other is Andrew Pinsent, who interestingly wrote about Aquinas as an example of second person philosophy. But there's something slightly grandiose about either first person or third person <laughs> philosophy. I mean, they both have aspirations um, to, to have the last word, to be final in a way. This is what I know. Or, or, you know, in the third person, it's almost more grandiose. I'm now speaking for the whole of humanity. This is how it is. Whereas second person uh, discussion is honest, isn't it? It's honest, it's modest, it's a process. It's something that we are engaged yes. in and we recognize yes. that it's not um, final in that way. So that, that's, that's important. I suppose what I, what I wanted to emphasize is the the nature of the both the importance and the limitations of, of reason and the importance of it is that one would be one would be a fool not to be shrewd as, as, as Whitehead says you know that reason is a form of shrewdness in other words in which we are we are careful not to be caught in a trap and if we didn't have this faculty to reason that would delay us and bring before us other questions, other ideas, we would be, in a way, given up to the first thing that came into our minds. We, we could be taken over by something that was completely mm -hmm. false. But what Whitehead emphasizes is that reason needs also to be exercised on itself, to be mm -hmm. able to, mm -hmm. to scrutinize its own processes. Mm -hmm. And what those processes are, are intermediate processes. And th there there is, again, um, a bit of a, a, a parallel with <clears throat> the way I described 
the left hemisphere as an intermediate processor. In other words, the sort of experience, the preconceptual experience is the strength of the right hemisphere. Then something is done to it by the left hemisphere and then that process of making more explicit, of analysing, is then given back to the right hemisphere where it must be integrated. It's the failure to take that third step that one so often sees in modern discourse where we analyse things into fragments and think, now we've got the reality. No, <laughs> you've done something very odd to it, which is revealing. It was important, but its use is now over. Now we must take that back and reintegrate it. <coughs> How interesting that this immediately evokes to me the, the, the analogy of the hemispheres with what we were saying just a few seconds or minutes ago about the second person, like one talking to another, and also the yes. idea of circularity, not just, well, this is the starting point, yes. I process it all, and I, and I output it well, but then this needs to be fed back through another system, and it's in this kind of dance where the thing works at, it, at its best. Uh, absolutely. But what it does tell you, though, is that reason can never be enough on its own because it is an intermediate processor. Mm. Uh, I mean, you, it, incidentally, people's lives would come to a standstill if they have to rely over much on reason. And uh, Antonio Damasio describes a, po uh, a patient called Elliot who had lost the faculty to... Uh, have intuitions or, or use imagination and had to work everything out from first mm. principles mm. and he not only had a miserably uh, taxing life <laughs> doing this but uh, reached some very bizarre conclusions much as people with schizophrenia do who are in a way doing exactly that trying to reach conclusions only by reason without having any sort of common sense by the way, the word common sense in English is, is unfortunate because it, in English we have two meanings of the word common. One is it, it, it's vulgar and cheap. <laughs> and the other is that it's um, something that we have in common. It is something that is shared. And what common sense means is an, an intuition of shared understanding. Um, and it's not at all common these days in the sense of actually occurring very often <laughs> or being in any sense simple. It's a sophisticated thing, um, d despite uh, its name. And, you know, on the, on the matter of um, reason being an intermediate processor, I, I sometimes say that it, it's, it's, um, it's supported by intuition and it's also completed by intuition. And what I mean by that is that reason can't get off the ground without having certain beliefs or propositions that are excused or protected from the reasoning process itself. It has to have somewhere to start that it just says, well, this I'm going to take as axiomatic. And what's interesting is that the word axiom is related to the Greek word axia, comes from the Greek word axia, which means value. So in fact, there are certain things that we consider to be of high value, and those we say are sacrosanct, those we will not examine with reason. We will now build reason on that basis. Mm. And, and it, it, this is an image that um, Wittgenstein puts rather nicely, that you know, a door must open uh, it must move freely, but for it to move freely, there must be part of it, which is the hinge that remains put where it is. Yes. And so that's one end of the process. And when I say completed, what I mean is just simply this business of the output of the rational process being taken back into a context sensitive, global understanding where it can finally make sense. So it, it, I say sometimes that reason uh, has the bookends of intuition. I don't know what that word is in Spanish, but in English, bookends are like these um, blocks of wood or, or sort of sometimes they're fashioned to look like books that can support a line of books. You might have one on the shelf behind you. No, you don't, actually. <laughs> no, I don't, but I put them all together. <laughs> they, 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 the support, they support each other. They, Maybe that's a, a bad well, that's idea. <laughs> That's very nice. I like the fact that your books support one another. <laughs> uh, but well, again, this this image you're, you're evoking, it's it's very organic and very beautiful and nourishing. Like the idea that, as you just said, that reason is first supported, and you were mentioning 
the etymology of axiom because you need to start from somewhere and also somewhere where you're not going to be some something that you're not going to be doubting at least for a little while you're not going to be doubting it but and then at the end well you need to again nourish it back complete it so it evokes this image of a mother um intuition as a mother uh -huh. as a father right that it's that it's just holding this poor child or even like a teenager because you know rationality thinks things they <laughs> they know everything and it's it's yes. patiently and lovingly holding it uh, and then yes. it can carry yes. itself to a certain way but then you need to just um receive it back and maybe at least that helps to me to, to understand better why when we speak about rationality and we cherish its critical power and um, well it why it can be critical of the sources it analyzes but it has trouble being critical of its own limits and of its own methods right it seems now as, as something very yes. natural that this creature um, that we call rationality is so good at being critical except of its own limitations and methods yes yes well i like your image of the of the mother and uh, the child because of course um, that is how intersubjectivity is achieved. The child is originally fused, and then it is the role of the mother infant dyad to produce a, a position where the child realizes that it is distinct, but not separate in the sense of having no connection. So it's fulfilled as an individual being, as the mother is, but it still has this capacity for understanding which is intersubjective with the mother and with all others, as it were, that are then later encountered. Yeah. But your, your point about being able to criticize itself <clears throat> has important relevance to two things, really. One is the the the, um, the idea which I think we can we can return to of what it, what lies beyond reason, but also the, the the extraordinary fact that for just about two thousand years, one axiom of, of Aristotle's and foreshadowed by Plato, uh, or, or two axioms really, the laws of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle, held sway as axiomatic. Um, and it's only really in the last couple of hundred years that uh, people have begun to say, well, no, uh, we may assume that, uh, that there is a law of non-contradiction and that, that there is the law of an excluded middle, but actually um, it's, we reach a more, um, a more veridical feeling and assessment and judgment and intuition of reality if we accept that sometimes we have to allow that contraries uh, can be um, uh, can be accepted together yes. and that you know the law of the excluded middle the idea that um, either a, a, a statement or its opposite statement in all cases are going to be true but unfortunately there are many cases in which neither of these is is the right uh, very very many cases in which neither of these would be the right assumption to make and this will be um, more explicit and also is a teaser to uh, forthcoming chapter on paradoxes, right? That's where you yes. always yes. shine in a very, in a more explicit way. And then you realize, wow, if I change the operating system, I can now think yes. paradoxes in a completely new and, and enlightening way that the previous axioms wouldn't allow me to, even if I was great at applying rationality, but that somehow I'm missing, I'm missing the reasons um, why this could, in in fact, be true, even though there are seen paradoxes. Yes, yes. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, to our discussion of that, which is chapter sixteen. So it's uh, uh, coming up quite soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Let let me let me also. Mm, sorry. Go on. Go on. No, carry I was on. Gonna, I was going to offer another invitation for a small derailment, which is that you wrote this, your first book actually was mm -hmm. called Against Criticism. So I would like to yes. dwell a few more minutes on, again, what criticism can do for us and can't do for us and why you wrote that book in the context of reason and rationality. Okay, it's, it's a, a good connection, I think. Um, 
Well, again, criticism can be understood in, in more than one way. It can be understood as a combative process um, in which one forms a judgment, uh, perhaps based on logic, um, because the root of the word criticism, again, is krisis in, in Greek, which is a judgment. Uh, and so uh, that judgment can, can be a, a combative and um, a logical one. And at times it may be helpful to use this a little, but if that's the only way in which you approach a work of art, or even the principal way in which you approach a work of art, you will miss most of its value and meaning because exactly the sort of things that the reasoning process is not good at are, are the things that, for example, poetry is there to, to transcend. Poetry is there to use language to get beyond language. It's, it's rather like um, that idea from um, uh, oriental martial arts that you use the strength of your opponent to overcome him. <laughs> and and poetry is a way of using language to get beyond language, I espousing very importantly many implicit layers of meaning that interact with one another, and also the context, which again, reason tends to, um, to, to towards abstraction, or can do, doesn't have to, but mm. that first kind of reason, the very, uh, the rationality kind, does tend towards decontextualization and abstraction. And that, that's something that I wrote about quite a lot in, I think, the next chapter, chapter 15. So we won't talk about that right now. <laughs> but yes. but um, yeah. In other occasions, you've told me that when analyzing a poem in this way, a poem it could be another, it could be a living organism, actually. This kind of vivisection of it has to do yes. about you you told me it has to do about everything except the very thing we're supposed to be analyzing there is this yes. losing of the very thing we have in front by using certain yes. methods and not others and, and and in a way your book is this as i see it is an effort to just be able to see this thing we've always had in front but we're constantly missing because perhaps we're using the wrong means or we're using them incompletely as you were alluding to this image of well it has to be su supported and nourished back and forth and then we can see what's the matter with things yes yes yeah and i hope that um that what i that, that my my method my writing is is an example of using reason and using language um in order to allow something that lies beyond both of them to come forward. Mm, mm. Um, that's certainly one of my aims anyway. Um, and um, yet there's a, an exclusive cast of mind nowadays. It's the one that in science leads to scientism, that because science is a very valuable tool, um, it, it can do everything, but it can't. Reason is a very valuable tool, but it can't go everywhere and uh, sometimes philosophers use the term ratiocentrism mm. which is the equivalent of scientism the belief that everything can be encompassed by by reason alone mm. and when we say reason sometimes but, we mean as you're right to give reasons for but also this make it distinct from having having and giving reasons right that's also a very important yes. point you make it sounds obvious but i think it's at least it's non-trivial that one can try to give reasons, but often one has reasons, but it's hard to know what these reasons are, even if one thinks one has them. Well, well quite probably when one expresses them, one's going to truncate them, one's going to um, make them smaller, uh, make them deliberately clearer, sharper than their subject allows. I, I want to make a distinction between um, a kind of clarity or lack of it that is dependent on one's mode of approach and a kind of clarity or lack of it that's dependent on the nature of the thing we're approaching. So um, I'm a great fan of clarity. Um, I, I believe it's a duty uh, to one's read, reader, to one's interlocutor, to be as clear as one can, but no clearer. <laughs> and not a jot, not a whit, not a 
uh, not a tiniest bit more than the subject matter permits. And there are certain subject matters that are simply not well encompassed by language. Anything to do with the spiritual or religious uh, falls into this category. Anything to do with um, the arts, uh, by which I mean things like poetry, literature, music, um, uh, painting, architecture, all, all these things, um, we can talk about them, we can rationalise about them, but we must recognise that in doing so we won't be able to express the most central thing about them, which is the relationship that they induce in us and the awakening that they cause for us. Uh, I think that in our time, philosophy has become very, very much narrower than it used to be. Um, and even as far forward as the Enlightenment, uh, so from Plato through Aquinas, um, forward to Descartes, Spinoza and Kant, you find philosophers as being great thinkers across a range of, of topics. Um, they would deal with ethics, they would deal with political issues, they would deal with metaphysical issues. Um, but nowadays, um, both the method, which is uh, purely analytic um, in, in the Anglo-American analytic tradition, which I think still holds sway in most university faculties in the English-speaking world, both the method and the subject matter have shrunk. Um, and, and in a way that's not helpful, actually, because if you decide that some things can only be understood by analysis, I mean, not only are there the problems that we've touched on, that um, <clears throat> the whole is greater than the sum of the parts you're going to end up with, and that by doing this you destroy the context, which gives part of the meaning, and so on. But actually, the process of analysis, if you think of it as a way of a clarifying and understanding, mm -hmm. that is in fact an illogical, illogical assumption mm -hmm. because analysis um, is going to depend on you explaining something in terms of something else. Um, and that something else unless what you're saying about it is circular, must introduce another element that's not already in the picture. And that now needs to be defined. And so this process of definition mm -hmm. leads to a further and further regress in which the thing that was to illuminate mm -hmm. the first thing you started with now has to be defined, and the next thing defined as well. Yeah. And this process literally has no end. Yes. Yeah, so one way round this is to is to go is to think uh, what one image again, which brings us back to a circle rather than a line, is the idea of going back and forth between some sense of the parts that go to make something up and some sense of the holes that this thing can become part of, can help create or bring about. Mm -hmm. So both downwards to what happens when you, you go deeper and break it up, and upwards by looking at the sort of things that this can become part of. Because mm -hmm. after all, it, it tells you as much about something that it's made up of various ingredients. Yes. Uh, that tells you something, but it tells you as much when you say, but this thing that we're looking at as a whole, can itself become part of something much greater than itself and is a, an important ingredient of that. So we understand it both by looking downwards and by looking upwards. And as you're saying this, it reminds me of, of this mention you make about the, this Chinese glyph to, to, that, that represents or conveys what we say in English, which is to think. And you explain oh, that, yes. that to think, um, the glyph um, evokes a tree, an eye, and a heart. So as you're saying from the top and from the bottom, I was visualizing the tree, but it's also very, very uh, opportune that it mentions the heart, because what you've been saying about the clarity just now and a few minutes ago, um, really evokes this idea of a loving, of, of a loving gaze onto things. And, yes. and also, also I was thinking, and I didn't think about this before, which is great because it means like us having a conversation there's something new coming in, which is that towards <laughs> the end of your chapter, you mention yes, this, this breadth of vision that true philosophers have and had, mm. and, and therefore epistemology, as I see, is hybridized with ethics. 
and maybe it's going too far but but as you're describing again well i i may be seeking for clarity but what about the thing i'm looking at with this case does it lend itself to be as clear as i want it to be or not and, and to me this sounds like some sort of uh, ethical epistemology or or some, something like this, because in this encounter with reality, whether it is literally another person or a dog, but also with reality as a, as a, as a whole, um, there is this kind of respect for the other thing. And, and, and that just comes very nicely with this idea of the heart, the eye and the tree the, to think. I mean, there's something <clears throat> ethical about this way of encountering the world, and it's very profound. And I didn't realize until now um, as you were talking about well, seeking clarity and how much clarity can we demand of the thing we're trying to look at? Yes, uh, absolutely. And and I think your attention to the idea of the ethical is, is very good because what you're really illuminating is that there isn't just one way of attending to something in order to understand it. It's, a, it's a, um, a tentative process in which we try different modes of attention to see which is most fruitful, which res which, to which the object responds, which kind of attention is the appropriate attention here. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, I say attention is a moral act because of this very fact that we are, we are being true to something when we attend to it carefully, not yeah. just imposing our um, previous uh, idea that it all must be made to fit fit in a certain kind of logical grid. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's a very very nice point of view. And one of the things that we will realize in approaching things is that certain kinds of attempts to clarify them actually obfuscate them. And so there's this actually a necessity of allowing the the. The, the essence of what one's looking at to express itself as something that cannot be clarified in language. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that if one reaches a point where one accepts that and is able to communicate that, that is not a failure of being careful enough. It is actually being so careful to be attentive to the nature of the thing one is describing that one doesn't as I say somewhere, one doesn't try to squash it like a dragonfly into a matchbox yes. and destroy it. Yes. And, and we, we, so parts of whatever it is are going to be hidden. This is a, a, a point that was made by Heraclitus. Um, it was made by Bacon. Uh, it was made by uh, Einstein mm. uh, that we should, you know, we can be clear about things, but not any further than the subject matter itself mm. permits. And again, Richard Feynman says this about physics, exactly the same idea. So it's not just about, for example, the natural world or about art, but it's also true about anything that the mind encounters. Yes, that, that's fascinating, what you just said, that, that, that attention, attention is a moral act, because this opens the door immediately uh, like when we're trying to get at what is true, is the whole point of this part. Well, if if we violate truth in that sense, in, in, with this narrowness, simultaneously we violate beauty and, and goodness. But if we don't, then beauty and goodness and truth, they all come to, they all re reunite together. It's not just about what is true or not, but it's by letting in um, this ethical aspect and this this beauty of the thing we're contemplating that in this reunion, I think it's where this kind of magic, magic trick or magic ceremony can take place. This boot, bootstrapping uh, of, of of seeing one's limitations and going beyond. In a way, it seems to yes, start happening yes. the moment you you realize that. Mm. Yes, and and the reason that's important is because, as Whitehead said, as we think, mm. we live. So that adopting a certain way of thinking about the world makes us live our lives in a certain way, which at the moment we are finding both spiritually barren and physically destructive of mm. the world. So the kind of philosophy we have is important. And one thing that one notices with some dismay is that philosophy is becoming ever more narrow and more technical. Mm. Um, you get this image of the, the technical philosopher <laughs> um, 
that uh, I, I put up the, the, the article on, on my channel, actually, this, this beautiful piece um, in, in which... Um, what was the name of the author? Can you remind me? No, I could I could look it up um, while while you explain it, so so we can we can tell it to the audience. Okay. Yes. 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 It, the idea it, it's a satirical piece um, by a, a, a professional philosopher uh, about what was happening around him that people really wanted to imitate science. Uh, I also found this in in the world of um, the humanities generally, that people try to base what they're doing on something that has the, the kudos that they associate with science. And um, so uh, he says that the, what the philosopher would really like would be to turn up in a white lab coat um, and deliver a short um, paper in which there is a summary of what is being investigated, um, a, a set of propositions leading to a conclusion, and the thing is simple, short, and utterly devoid of uh, anything of interest because the subjects that one's trying to um, illuminate don't allow themselves or don't uh, permit themselves to be unveiled or illuminated by this kind of a process. Mm -hmm. I, I can I can I can find it now in the in the case of the moment, but certainly that can be an invitation for for our viewers to, of course, read the book and also go to the website. I did actually I did it when when I when I was reading the chapter and since you were pointing it that that there was a version available, I actually went there and. Yes, and, and printed yeah. the whole thing. Yes, it it, it, oh, okay. it it helps to understand maybe why why people still think that philosophy is something practiced by, by a bunch of usually a bunch of men detached from society as a kind of a, 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 a <laughs> self congratulatory congratulatory entertainment. Whereas the way I think you, you're enacting philosophy is something that should help you to live well and live bet a better life. Um, and it's a completely different view yes. of, well, of the, that saying, well, that's just philosophy. No, no, precisely. That is philosophy and it should, it should be of great value to everyday life. We need to recover the root meaning of philosophy, the love of wisdom. And I, mm -hmm. I remember twice in my life talking to <clears throat> philosophers about the way that their subject seemed to have got into rather unfruitful sidelines and saying you know what about the meaning of the word philosophy and, and one said well what is the meaning of the word philosophy um, but in both cases they said no philosophy has nothing to do with the love of wisdom uh, <laughs> it's, some, it's a special arcane ritual carried out as you say by mainly men of a certain cast of mind in protected situations yeah. in modern western universities yeah. but uh, tr true philosophy is something that has to be part of one's whole life another point that's made in that essay I wish I could remember the name of the author but anyway um, the, in that essay is that as it were at the end of the day the philosopher hangs up his lab coat and goes home and his professional life has nothing to do with the rest of his life whereas it seems to me essential that <clears throat> one, if one is a philosopher and one's thinking about things that it ramifies into all one's life and all one's experience mm. yes it should have consequences <laughs> mm. Beyond, it does, uh, as, it as, does. As you write in a rather polite but sometimes sarcastic way beyond seminar rooms it should make a difference beyond hiring committees and 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 seminar rooms otherwise yes. how narrow and how pity and what 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 a pity actually that something so grand um, ends up being yes. this kind of justing exercise well yes that's, yes that's something. not <laughs> That's not what we're doing, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. But we're, we're trying to avoid it. Um, I mean, that's the best one can say, is that one, one tries to avoid those particular traps, and, mm. and that's, that's the best one can do. Yes. But, I mean, perhaps in conclusion, I don't know we, we, whether we're concluding, but I, I just want to reinforce the idea that just because reason or rationality uh, can't solve 
many problems, it's not a reason to abandon it. Absolutely not. Um, it's an incredibly important uh, tool in our, in our, our momentum of ways of, of dealing with experience. Mm. Mm. And it, 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 in modern life, it's, it's far too often neglected. And if people actually used reason in the sense of uh, the right hemisphere idea of it as being a much um, broader faculty, mm. it would be possible to finesse positions and to be able to say the sort of things I'm constantly saying, mm. that on the one hand there is great strength and goodness in something, but on the other there are limits in it. This is the kind of... <laughs> um, capacity to, to, to bring together um, things that look superficially to be contrary that we seem to be losing and that is leading to unpleasantness, aggression um, and um, a, a really very un, unfruitful and, and unedifying uh, kind of public discourse. Yes, and, and what, what transpired throughout your work is these two words, yes and, right? So if we would use yes and more often, things would be simpler and, and, and more powerful, as you just said. Reasons and limitations are not a reason to abandon it, and to insist on reason alone is deeply irrational. So if we could hold these two yes. thoughts simultaneously, yes. um, we would be much better off. <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. Great. Well, is, is, okay, is that... I think, hmm. I think we can leave it here. Um, and hmm. There's much more to say, I'm sure, related to that in the following chapter, chapter 15, and so on. But I think that's, that's, yes. that's really good for, for today. Thank you so much again, Ian. It's a pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much, Alex. That's great.